Hello, this is Goji here. Welcome to the reaction video. And today we'll be reacting to GMK Godzilla Kaiju Profile by Vicky Zillow. And yep. I wasn't gonna do a reaction on this, most because I usually don't I have never reacted to uh Ricky Zeta before. Never. <laughs> I don't think I did. I think I did. I know I watch his videos, but I haven't reacted to any of them. And this one just came out, so might as well do a reaction because it's brand new. See what information he got wrong and see what information he got right. He probably got it all right because Ricky Zeta never goes on great um i never see them miss any information we do point out later on but they usually get it right that's what you get when trying to view stats <laughs> but with that said let me share screen real quick forgot to do that before so recording you know the deal nope uh, here we go. Ain't, ain't that long. It's only 22 minutes. I thought it'd be longer. Let's watch, shall we? The Millennium Godzilla series nearly ended in 2000. Ticket sales for the first two entries lagged far behind the last five Heisei films. After the TriStar debacle, the public seemed to be burnt out on Godzilla. Toho had yet to commit to financing a third Millennium film when Godzilla vs. Megaguirus stumbled into theaters on December 16, but they had already reached out to a director with a sterling reputation among kaiju fans, Shusuke Kaneko. Who helmed Dai's Heisei Gamera trilogy? Having yeah, like, first asked Toho to direct Godzilla. I'm just gonna say this right here GMK is better than the Heisei Gamera trilogy. I know that's an, un, that's an unpopular opinion and is never heard of, but I, yeah, it's easy one of the best of Shishisaki Kano's best um, Heisei, not Heisei films, best films, like. Come on, that guy needs to be bad in the wedding show. I swear to God, he, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, come on, all four of his films are amazing, and even like his weakest film, Guardian of the Universe, which isn't bad. It's just not my favorite, but yeah. All his films are phenomenal. I'm just saying it right here and right now. All of his films are phenomenal. I highly recommend you check out his films because those films are the GOAT. <laughs> yeah. Like, I would love to see Shuzuki Kakiano come back. Like, come on. Just see him come back in the directing chair will be so much nostalgia. Like, Maybe have him do the Godzilla vs. Gamma movie. Like, come on. Heck, there was even rumor that heck, I remember reading an article online saying that uh Toho wanted to have uh Shizuka Kakiano um direct because of his gamma for 2003. That was like one of the planned directors they had that they wanted to get down. But due to but due to um, Daya and Toho not agreeing on who would win, it wasn't made. So we were never under. So we will never fully know what Shuzi Kakiano's true vision was for that Godzilla vs. Gamma. Was something left unsaid? <laughs> I'm just imagining what that vision would have been. My God, she's Kakiano's because of his gamma. <laughs> yeah. But that said, let's see at, shall we? I mean, not that. Let me just continue reacting. Uh, almost a decade ago, 
he wasn't about to let his chance fade out, impressing them with his vision for an overwhelmingly powerful, malevolent Godzilla with an equally powerful message. Hey Kaiju fans, I'm Titanolante, and I'll be presenting the Kaiju profile on the GMK Godzilla. The GMK Godzilla stars in Godzilla, Mothra, and Ghidorah, giant monsters all out of time. Oh my god, it is By far the most commonly abbreviated title in the entire franchise. God, that intro. <laughs> that freaking intro. Oh god. Okay, I'm gonna. S oh god, I love this fucking soundtrack. <laughs> As another reboot that's only in continuity with the 1954 original, the film presents him as the second Gojira to emerge, 50 years after the first. See, Godzilla Vita? It is the second Godzilla. Told you so. <laughs> first. Unlike his predecessor, this Godzilla is possessed by the millions of souls killed during the Pacific War and seeks revenge against Japan for forgetting and ignoring the past. Opposing the God of Destruction in his quest for retribution are the three guardian monsters of Japan, along with the nation's defense force. This incarnation has some appeared in non-film media since then, likely due to his unique origin and malevolence, mm -hmm. although he and his film did have an outsized influence on Toe's latest entry, Godzilla Minus One. Two minutes in. Shusuke Kaneko wasn't the first person to envision Godzilla as literal specter of World War II. Writing about the original Godzilla in 1994, film critic Saburo Kawamoto described Godzilla as embodying the souls of Japan's military war dead. Still under the spell of Japan's emperor system, he spares the imperial it. palace in Tokyo while showing the surrounding area rapidly rebuilt after the war, no mercy. Longtime composer for the series, Akira Ifukube, agreed with Kawamoto's basic premise, saying in 1995 that this interpretation was common among his generation. A pacifist kaiju enthusiast like Kaneko would have been well aware of it, but he decided to have his Godzilla inhabited by all of the lives lost in the Pacific War, not just Japanese soldiers. As the character Hirotoshi Isayama explains in the film, these restless souls have him to attack Japan because its people have forgotten the mass suffering their country was responsible for during the war. Yuri Tachibana yeah. theorizes that while the Japanese soldiers amongst these souls don't seek Japan's destruction themselves, they are outnumbered by the souls from other countries, as well as Japanese victims of the atomic bombs. Kaneko's early ideas for the film that eventually became Jim K had Godzilla fighting Kamakura of all things, then a mutated astronaut possibly inspired by Jamila from the original Ultraman. The supernatural angle emerged in a screenplay titled Godzilla against Varen, Baragon, and Anguirus, giant monsters all at attack, which won producer Shogo Tomiyama's approval. However, Toho chairman Isao Matsuoka infamously asked Kanek to replace Varen and Anguirus with the more recognizable King Ghidorah and Mothra. <laughs> Japan's military also fielded Maser Cannons and the Gotengo against Godzilla in this draft, which gave way to more grounded weapons in the final version. Even before Toho gave him the green light, Kaneko chose Fuyuki Shinada, who had previously sculpted the likes of Biollante, Goblosaurus, Iris, and Legion, to design Godzilla. Shinada's creation. Damn. Light, Kaneko chose Fuki Shinada. Damn, he. Man, he chooses this guy? <laughs> Fuki Shinada. The guy who made Legion and Ibis. Damn. Then realize that GMK Goji was. But the... 
But it's the same guy who did like Ibis and Legion, which are some of the best designs in the Gamma Heisei trilogy. <laughs> yeah, then especially Legion and Ibis. Man, Shuzuki Akiyano would know what he was doing. <laughs> who had previously sculpted the likes of Biollante, Godzilla-saurus, Iris, and Legion, to design Godzilla. Shinada's creation, revealed in maquette form at the press conference announcing GMK on March 3, 2001, was a fairly traditional Godzilla in most respects, but it also had a more horizontal stance, with its tail raised off the ground like a real dinosaur and completely white eyes. The latter intended to make Godzilla more frightening and conspicuously supernatural. Kaneko had in mind a Godzilla who would harken back to the 1954 and 1964 suits, a departure from the colorful and spiky Mideoji design used in the previous two films, and traits of their head designs came forth as Shinada got to work on the new suits and props. Bringing Godzilla to life in GMK required a V-Shop team led by Shinada to build two primary suits, indistinguishable on the outside. One of them, equipped with a full suite of mechanisms in the head and movable dorsal fins, Damn. was dubbed the performance was suit. Each was modular, with movable dorsal fins and feet, and emphasized flexibility and a consistent shape, with perforated urethane foam used for joints. Standing 220 centimeters tall, or 7 foot 2 inches, they remained the tallest Godzilla suits ever built for a film, allowing him to tower over his kaiju opponents. The raised elephant feet helped add some extra centimeters. As a result of the suit's height, GMK was the only film in the Millennium series in which 5'3 Tsutomu Kitagawa did not play Godzilla. He was replaced with 5'10 Mizuho Yoshida. Damn. Having already uh. inhabited Legion, Ghidorah, and Dagara, Yoshida was no stranger to hulking monsters. However, the maquette stance proved impractical for him and he assumed the typical vertical stance in the film itself. The eyes also deviated slightly from the maquette. They remained white. Man, that's gotta hurt. Whipping up that, you're only like 5'10", and you're, and you're in a like 7'2 suit. Ooh, that's gotta hurt. Imagine how much back, how much weight you're putting on your back. Ugh. Man, that's gotta hurt. <laughs> Ooh, boy. Mm. Yes. Right, but gained some gray veins. This was out of fear that the pure white eyes wouldn't photograph well and could even be offensive on a homicidal monster, as white eyes are often used as visual shorthand for people with blindness in Japan. Mizuho Ishida referenced Haruo Nakajima's performance in King Kong vs. Godzilla for the monster battling and Kenpachiro Satsuma's Heisei Godzilla's for walking. To make the role his own, he tried to incorporate more hand movements, playing to the costume's strengths, and walked with his arms further away from his body, with his palms held down. Norman England, reporting on the film for Kaneko's website and fan- There he is! I knew the eventually do that. <laughs> I knew the eventually reference Norman England. Oh god. <laughs> uh... Goria was highly impressed. To describe Yoshida as simply a hard worker would be a disservice. He's not only channeling every ounce of effort into his performance, but is enjoying the hell out of it. When not playing Godzilla, he's talking to someone about an upcoming shot, or he's off on the sidelines striking Godzilla stances and growling about the stage. A water suit was also made, and yet another briefly appears in the film, although it was empty and pulled by a crane, a modified Miragoji attraction suit. Necessary for the scene where King Ghidorah's big spark ball blasts Godzilla into Tokyo Bay. Other props included a bust animatronic with rings of reinforced plastic (FRP) inside the neck, a tail a handle, what appears to be a standalone arm, a giant foot dating back to Invasion of Astro Monster, a three meter tall stretch of skin for the big surfacing scene, two more stretches of skin for the opening credits, and the DO3 torpedo drilling through his wound and even a disembodied blue screen heart prop. The heart in the finished film is CGI, based on one sculpted by Hiroshi Sagai. The film also used CG for Godzilla swimming underwater, some overhead shots, and his insides. 
You're up against the raging god of the dead. How are you going to take him down? Sword or axe? In 1954, the first Godzilla devastated Tokyo. He was ultimately killed by Dr. Serizawa's oxygen destroyer, but the newly formed defense force, fearing they would be disbanded, told the public they had vanquished the monster themselves. Amidst the wave of monster sightings around the globe, kicked off by a Godzilla-like creature who attacked the United States, the second Godzilla first in his presence since known when he sank an American nuclear submarine near Guam in 2002 and fed on its reactor. Japan dispatched two small submarines called Satsuma to help locate the vessel. They found it with conspicuous claw marks on the hull. Still lurking nearby, Godzilla menaced the Satsuma, destroying one of them, with the other capturing footage of his dorsal plates. After the surviving pilot delivered his report, Lieutenant General Katsumasa Mikumo expressed confidence that their modern weapons could easily repel the monster. Enough time had passed. He and many others in the Defense Force now believed the lie their predecessor advised. A mysterious eccentric named Hirotoshi Itayama warned reporter Yuri Tachibana of Godzilla's return and how he was driven by restless spirits of the Pacific War dead who attacked Japan for forgetting about the carnage it once unleashed across Asia and beyond. Godzilla next raided Magonote in the Bonin Islands, then brought down a plane scanning the island for survivors. He reached the Japanese mainland several days later, rising out of Yaizu Harbor, after seeming to target a survivor from Magonote who'd been hospitalized, the cut fired his atomic breath at a group of fleeing citizens, generating a mushroom cloud. He rampaged his way to Hakone, where he was confronted by Baragon, one of the three ancient guardian beasts who had awakened to protect Japan from him. The god of the earth made the first move, digging out the ground beneath Godzilla's feet to knock him over and then jump onto and sinking his teeth into his arm. Godzilla soon hurled the Sirenian monster away and subsequently brutalized him. Once Baragon managed to get to higher ground, he attempted another jump attack. This time, Godzilla checked him with a tail swing. As Baragon tried to clamber up the cliff once more, the Big G fired his atomic breath into the side of the cliff. With the resulting landslide leaving Baragon vulnerable, the King of the Monsters promptly obliterated his foe and could proceed unimpeded. By nightfall, a squadron of F-7Js were deployed to intercept Godzilla. Their bombs were only effective in annoying him, however. He swiftly shot down the fighter jets and continued his march towards the heart of the capital region. The defense force set up at Yokohama, with Yuri's father, Brigadier General Kaizo Tachibana, taking command. Two more guardian monsters, Mothra and Ghidorah, emerged in Lake Ikeda and Aokigahara, respectively and converged on the city. Mothra arrived first, attacking Godzilla with her wings and stingers and evading his atomic breath. Ghidorah emerged from underground as she grappled Godzilla, electrifying him with his bites. Godzilla responded with a bite of his own, batted Mothra out of the way with his tail when she tried to intervene, and hurled Ghidorah into a building. He unleashed his atomic breath against Ghidorah, knocking him unconscious, but Mothra shielded him a second blast. The Defense Force made its move, targeting Godzilla with DO-3 missiles designed to drill through rock, but the weapon failed to penetrate his hide, and his retaliatory strikes wiped out 9% of the outfit. He closed in on Tachibana's ship, the back cruiser Aizu, only to turn and vaporize Mothra when she again tried to intervene. Her life force flowed into Ghidorah, reviving him as the winged King Ghidorah. His energy shield blocked Godzilla's atomic breath before he launched it at the King of the Monsters. A tremendous explosion blasted Godzilla into the bay and opened up a small wound on his shoulder. King Ghidorah and Godzilla continued their battle underwater. Aizu launched two Satsumas armed with Yo-3 torpedoes in the hopes of firing them into his wound, with one of the submersibles piloted by Taizo. At the last moment, however, Godzilla put one of King Ghidorah's necks into the first torpedo's path. He fell the dragon with his atomic breath, then grabbed Taizo's sub, which had used to fire its weapon. 
dangling over the water after a stray blast from Godzilla had struck the bridge she was reporting from, Yuri dropped a piece of sacred stone left for her by Isayama. It revived King Ghidorah for a second time, allowing him to break the fall of her and novelist Mitsuki Takeda. Taizo escaped Godzilla's grip as King Ghidorah re-engaged him. Glowing with power, King Ghidorah assailed Godzilla with gravity beams, but after a few hits, he began to absorb them. Godzilla responded with a gravitational atomic breath, which blew Ghidorah to pieces. The spirits of the three guardian monsters then manifested and soared into Godzilla, causing him to sink into the bay. Seeing no other prospect for victory, Taizo piloted his sub into Godzilla's mouth and fired the DO-3 torpedo at his wound from the inside. Godzilla surfaced to confront Yuri and Takeda. Just then, the torpedo emerged from his shoulder and detonated, leaving a sizable hole. Godzilla attempted to annihilate the two humans, only for his atomic breath to twice shoot out of his shoulder. Wounded, he toppled underwater. Taizo escaped through the hole. When Godzilla took aim at him with a third ray, the monster exploded. Yuri's boss, Haruki Kadokura, ordered the channel to produce a special on Godzilla, only to find that Isayama had disappeared in Yuri's video of their interview. Atsushi Maruo, another reporter, divulged that he looked Isayama up and learned that he went missing during the first Godzilla's attack, leaving Kadokura shaken. At the bottom of Yokohama Bay, Godzilla's disembodied heart continued to beat. Is that what I think? Oh no, I already seen that. Wait a minute. Whereas the two previous Millennium Godzillas spewed a flaming orange heat ray, GMK brought back the blue laser beam. This iteration's base atomic breath brings to mind the spiral heat rays of the Versus series and Final Wars, in terms of its consistent capability to cripple or outright destroy opponents fearlessly. Point blank shots of it incinerated Baragon and annihilated Mothra both within seconds while Ghidorah was KO'd by single blasts on two occasions, one of them underwater. Thousand Year Dragon's one-time energy shield was the only object which resisted a sustained blast. When Godzilla first unleashed the heat ray, it produced a large mushroom cloud, and the accompanying shock was felt even from kilometers away. Moreover, this Godzilla a quick-draw sharpshooter with his heat ray, dispatching all four FCJs dropping bombs on him in five seconds. His aim only faltered against the more maneuverable Mothra. After channeling the energy from King Ghidorah's gravity beams into his dorsal fins, Godzilla fired a gravitational atomic breath, a stronger variant of the heat ray wrapped in a yellow spiral, against the three-headed monster, triggering a spectacular explosion. Once the flames dispersed, Ghidorah's shred remains rained that's down that's onto the surface of the water. It's unclear. Oh, so that's what it's called. I when I was a kid, I just usually call it lightning breath, <laughs> lightning atomic breath. That, that's legit what I called it. I didn't know it was there was an actual name for it, like gravitational atomic breath. Hmm. If Godzilla could absorb and redirect other energy attacks in this way, or if his fellow supernatural creatures' gravity beams had some quality that allowed him to exploit them. While he consistently uses atomic breath as a finishing move. The GMK Godzilla is a dangerous tooth and claw fighter too. Against Baragon, he deployed forceful stomps and kicks, showcasing surprisingly quick reflexes a couple of times. Mothra was also blindsided by his tail. Against Ghidorah, 
His bite drew blood from the three-headed monster, and he later threw him, a classic Godzilla move. The G Godzilla has the character's usual invulnerability to military weapons. Even the fictitious DO-3 missiles, designed to drill through rock, failed to penetrate his hide. Each of the Guardian monsters was able to topple him at least once, though he never stayed down for long. Only King Ghidorah's big spark ball was able to break his skin, and even that spectacular attack only chipped a small chunk from his shoulder. Godzilla demonstrated impressive spatial awareness. Tailwind Barrier got into a nearby helicopter and maneuvering one of Ghidorah's necks to the path of a DO-3 torpedo. After Mothra exploited a blind spot, he twice unleashed attacks against her when she tried the same trick. Godzilla couldn't do much more than flail about when Mothra perched on the back of his head. The bug was out of reach of his stubby arms and evidently at too odd an angle to swat at with his tail. Not the swiftest goji on land either. Evidently lacking the instantaneous regeneration of certain other Godzillas, the wound left by King Ghidorah's big spark ball was successfully exploited by Brigadier General Taibana. The DO-3 torpedo he fired at the laceration from within the monster's body opened a gaping hole. Thereafter, Godzilla's attempt at firing atomic breath damaged him to the point of self-destruction. Incidentally, in one of Kaneko's later proposals for the film that became GK, Godzilla's atomic breath had an even greater vulnerability. He couldn't use it underwater. Wait. Welcome to the What? Klondike Adventures game. I pr promise it's the best one you've ever seen. Get ready for the expedition. Wait. He couldn't use the atomic breath under water? How the hell does that work? We legit see him use the atomic breath when shooting Ghidorah. And then we later see him use the atomic breath to blow up that bridge that uh, Yui is on. And he somehow can't use the atomic breath under water? That can't be right. I understand the strategy was to defeat Godzilla at sea, but he's Godzilla. He can just, you know, swim away and come back. Plus, even if you use the heat ray, even if we go by that assumption that he can't use the heat ray underwater, you s he's still going to kill you, even, well, even though he got... Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't use it underwater. Back in the design section, we cautiously qualified the GMK Goji as being the tallest Godzilla suit used in a film. That's because there's one suit used for a licensed appearance of the King of the Monsters which might be taller the one from the 2014 Godzilla Snickers commercial. Sadly, we don't have exact specs for the Snickers goji, but we do know who wore it for the commercial, Douglas Tate, as well as his height, 6 foot 4. Factoring that in low and looking at the available behind the scenes photos, it's very possible it surpasses the Sokoeki goji's build 7 foot 2 height. GMK received a one-shot manga adaptation in Telekoro Comic, most notable for cutting Baragon out of the story. It also marked the end of manga adaptations for Toho Godzilla films as a routine matter. The only entry to receive the treatment since has been Planet of the Monsters. Across the Pacific, the Sokogeki Goji design has seldom been used for IDW's comics, and it's easy to see why. Their stories typically cast Godzilla as an anti-hero while the GMK Godzilla is purely a villain. Godzilla in Hell Number 4 represents its only major appearance thus far, 
one of several forms Godzilla takes on throughout the miniseries. In this issue, Godzilla is trapped in a walled city, endlessly battling King Ghidorah and Destoroyah, and finding himself revived each time they kill him. Eventually, he tricks them into blasting a hole in the wall. As they dissolve, he escapes into a void even wider than his eyes. Art Adams also drew Sokoeki Goji for a Godzilla No. 1 cover, and he's one of the Godzilla's reader repulsive glimpses while trapped between realities at the end of Godzilla vs. the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Wait, that actually happened? The 2001 Godzilla and his stars were featured in an extremely obscure video game released before their movie even came out. Godzilla Giant Monsters Typing Attack is, as you might have guessed, a typing game where the big G's triumphs rest on correctly typing out Japanese words and phrases in the allotted time. The 2D version of the ancient Java mobile game Godzilla Monster Mayhem put the GMK Godzilla on the title screen, despite the in-game sprite not resembling him. He wouldn't make a more proper video game appearance until Godzilla Kaiju Collection in 2015, followed by Godzilla Defense Force in 2019. A Sokol Goji model in the Metaverse Thing XR world foreshadowed his arrival in Godzilla Battle Line early in 2023. He's an elite four-star unit with a powerful atomic breath and hit multiple targets, plus a swirl of shadows that weakens near enemies when he's called to the field or dispatched. Yes, the atomic breath shoots out of his neck every time, and his leader ability more or less generates a mushroom cloud. Pretty nice attention to detail for a freemium gacha game. The Godzilla glimpsed in Takashi Yamazaki's 2007 film, Always, Sunset on 3rd Street 2, looked a lot like the 2001 Godzilla, right down to the white eyes. In fact, the starting point for this design was a Sokogeki Goji garage kit by Shinsuke Niwa, which Yamazaki bought and resculpted. Toho gave him another crack at designing Godzilla for the 2021 amusement park attraction Godzilla the Ride, Giant Monsters Ultimate Battle, and with Godzilla Minus One, his vision for the Big G seems to have reached his final form. GMK is one of Yamazaki's favorite Godzilla films. Had to do it. This isn't even my final form! <laughs> Couldn't help us. And he acknowledged it as an unconscious influence on the Minus One screenplay. In both films, Godzilla's atomic breath creates a mushroom cloud, characters extol the virtues of having never gone to war, the finishing blow against Godzilla is dealt by a single pilot craft attacking him from the inside as he attempts to fire his atomic breath, and the final shot shows that a small piece of him is still alive. That wraps things up for the GMK Godzilla. Thank you for watching.
played some of them at that time. Oh, God. I was the only point as fan surrounded by a bunch of Bear fans. <laughs> oh, God. I'm so recording on that. Oh, fuck. I didn't realize I was so corny. I thought I ended the video. My bad. Uh, sorry, I was looking at some Fortnite stuff. All right. Uh, boy, how long was I recording for? <laughs> Jesus, 38 minutes. Oh, boy. I did not realize I was still recording. Uh, my bad. <laughs> what do you think of the video? Um, it's pretty good. Pretty informational. You probably got all the stuff answered for the part about the time, but it's not being used underwater. Like, if that's the case, if we couldn't use the time breath underwater, then how do you explain him shooting the time breath at the bridge? The bridge. Whatever name that bridge is, but Yui's on. And, um,. You know, shooting into a breath at the door. Yeah, he only does it twice, but still doesn't explain it. I don't know how that works. Yeah, how does that work? But with that said, I think it's a good informational video. It's really good. But with that said, it's time to go off. And remember, stay big, G fans.